Hey Joe, welcome to the show. Hey, nice, nice. To, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I wanted to have you on the show and talk about you know your career, a uh, bunch of interesting th- th- things that you did. Uh, talk about crowd cow and you know issues around uh, food in America in general, uh, and also some of the exciting things that you're doing around AI. Uh, but I think first to set the stage for the audience, uh, can you give a little bit um, you know insight into your early career? Uh, you know, how did you get into technology? Sure. How far back do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, as far as you want. Sure. My uh, my parents were computer people, and so I grew up in the uh, you know seven the eighties during the dawn of personal computing. We had an Apple II at my house, a Lisa. You know, if you know what a Lisa is, I had yeah. one of the house. So that should be all you need to know about what my house was like. So really in an era before personal computers was a thing, we had personal computers at my house to hack on and tinker with and play around with and learn programming and that sort of thing. So, you know, I learned basic programming when I was a little boy and hacked tons through high school just on little experimental projects and things. And of course, when I went to undergrad, I was a computer science major. So where did you go to? University of Washington, Allen School. Got it. And then you started out as a software engineer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I started out as a software engineer right around the late 90s when the internet was a thing coming around, Netsigate browser, et cetera. And I joined actually a um, a company that was owned by Paul Allen called Starwave, which was, believe it or not, it started out, as I think, as like CD-ROM company. It was like the new media, CD-ROM. And then when the internet was emerging, it pivoted to online services and new media. And it, it did these deals with ESPN and Disney for their brands. And so it was really the internet services behind those brands. And they had a lot of interactive sporting things and live draft, and which I worked on, and fantasy games. And the early incarnation of ESPN.com uh, uh, types of those types of online services. And I worked there. I dropped in there um, right out of school. Um, which is where I wanted to be. I wanted to be on the internet, not like desktop software. What was it like, you know, to be a software engineer back then? Because I feel like what it means to be a software engineer changes every five to six years. And like the tooling yeah. and the stack and the abstraction, those change. Yeah, it's totally true. It was funny when I <clears throat> was going through the department, of course, it's Linux when you're in school. Um, and then in, when you entered the industry, it's Windows. It was Windows at the time. And I grew up on Macs. Okay, so I grew up on Macs, mouse and cursor and programming and super card and these types of things and then layering and script on top. I was in school doing real programming, but on Linux. And I was very nervous because I thought in my first job, I'm going to have to learn Windows and I have no idea how to do it, how to program on that stack. So a lot of it was that. In terms of programming languages at the time, it was C++. You know, Java was emerging. I actually... I actually installed the alpha version of Java at the UW Computer Science Computer Lab, if you can believe that. Like Java wasn't on the lab until I installed it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that's what I was, I was kind of, I think I was young and I was realizing like, because I wasn't raised on Windows and that whole stack or Linux, I needed to go when Java, when I saw Java, I was like, that's my savior. I can jump on the new thing and I can be just as good as, uh, no one will have more years of experience than me. So I, I sort of jumped there. And the reason I went to Starwave, to be honest, was they had, I think, at least two of the original Java team members had gone to work at Starwave. So I thought, well, this is great. Internet, Java, and they got the team members there. This is like perfect. It's right here in Seattle. Or they were over in Bellevue near Factoria. I thought, I'm in. This is perfect. So I, I, I really, that was my number one job pick by far. I didn't want to work for Microsoft. I thought I would just wouldn't survive. But in terms of the internet stack, there wasn't an internet stack, you know, at that time. You know, if you were doing anything with a database backend, it was Oracle. And if you were deploying, you were racking servers, you know, and anything to do with networking, you were writing it from scratch or working with really heinous software to install and debug. And there was no templating languages for the web page stuff. You know, we had people in the company developing templating systems that were a little bit like what you have now in modern development, you know, for web 
development where you've got like a server and you're piping through a data format and you're rendering some interactivity. Like we had a guy there, I can't remember his name was Brian. He was building an entire JavaScript based platform for interactive apps, you know, and trying internally to sell it for the different interactive apps to sort of standardize and use it and have these benefits. But every group was like writing their own thing from scratch. Open a socket up, pipe like your own data format through it. And and like, it was, it was very early. And then uh, at some point you decided to start a, your own company, Snapwine. Yeah, that was uh, trying to remember after business school. So I'd, I'd started, I always had a lot of side projects and businesses. I had a import furniture company business that then I had a website for building um, storefronts for it. And I was so using that's Wayfair and Shopify combined. Kind of. It was so much earlier than that, but it was like it was an online furniture store. I had customers in New York and Florida. We ship antique furniture, but they would order on our website. This was back in 1998. Um and so I tried to form a company around the idea of that of that software. And it ended up being a project within the larger entity in Disney. It was called go.com with a bunch of my colleagues. It gave me a taste of entrepreneurship. Like you can build a new product and you can become a business. And I also in that realized like I need to become well-rounded and, you know, eventually I joined a startup that, um, and uh, the dot-com crash happened. And I thought maybe I should go back to business school. Like the opportunity cost of going back to business school is the best it's ever going to be because the market just crashed. So if I can get into a good school, maybe I'll do that. And I, and I did. And so I went for two years to MIT Sloan and met a bunch of great people, but I was dead set on getting back to entrepreneurship. I was just in school to learn how to communicate and to learn business fundamentals and to meet people so that I could start a company. So I went back, you know, within a year of graduating, I had recruited two co-founders and started a company and, and that was snapped fine, um, which we raised venture capital for and, you know, eventually sold the company right before the, the 2008 crash. What did the company do? It was, you have to imagine back to 2005, you know, there's no iPhone, um, there's no mobile internet. There's a thing called WAP, which was an idea of, can you take the internet protocol stack and create a lightweight version of it that'll work on mobile devices which are so underpowered relative to desktop computers. And they've got to fit inside the carrier network because the carriers have to provision service, right? So there was a whole stack around this and we had worked in that area just before I went to business school um, at the startup. Um, when I got out and I realized, um, and we'd all realized from that experience, no one was using that stuff. It was too slow and cumbersome. But what people were using their phones for was voicemail and text message. So we thought, uh, I kind of discovered that the voiceover IP, which was coming around with Skype and so forth, those protocols were actually very open and you could program on them. And, and so I created a little demo where, you know, we had a voice over IP stack running on a server and I could talk to it. I could place phone calls, receive phone calls, text messages, et cetera. And I had this demo where, you know, you could input five phone numbers in a web page and click a button and they would all ring and everyone's now talking to each other at the same time. And, it, and, every, and at the time, right, this is 2005, people were like, what just happened? That's magic, you know? But so it was the nexus of Snapvine was, okay, mobile internet failed with the, the WAP stuff. People are using voicemail and text messages. Um, everybody's got a cell phone now. Kids are very social and they're coming on this thing called MySpace. But what do they do when they're at school? They've got their phone, not their computer. So how can we bridge the world of that world and their phone so they can use it between classes and with friends and in a group setting? So we built kind of a, voice over IP based group messaging service. And we, you know, built a widget that could plug into MySpace. And that was the idea behind the company. We launched it and I think we had a million users in the, in, within five weeks, it totally went viral. And then we had celebrities using it, you know, like 50 cent used it and a um, bunch of Disney stars that have, that are still famous people now were using it when they were kids. Um, and that made it even more viral. And it was just servers on fire, keep up with traffic, no business model. Uh, when we tried to monetize with ads, MySpace called us and said, we're gonna turn you off, you know, and sue you, don't do that, you know? So we had to sort of pivot 
and figure out how to build our own network with our own use, which is very difficult. And things were slowing down for us by then. And, and the writing was on the wall with regard to those business models at the time. So we were kind of staring down a bigger, a bigger pivot. Um, and we decided uh, we had the opportunity to sell the company, kind of a team and technology acquisition that um, ended up being really fortuitous timing, given that a few months later, the entire market, you know, with the financial crisis crashed. So I think we we were lucky. Already into two crashes. Mm -hmm. Already uh, and, two crashes. Yeah. And then you yeah. started Media Piston. Was, uh, this yeah. is after Snapline? Yeah. So Media Piston, I, I worked for the acquirer of Snapline for two years. Um, and during that time, uh, my, you know, my wife and I, she got pregnant. We were having a baby on the way. And, and I sort of timed it so that my two-year mark at that acquirer plus the day the baby was born plus the day that I started on on Media Piston was all kind of the same day so it was actually really wonderful so Media Piston was a bootstrapped company the idea was um, people need to uh, need high quality content and it's hard to get that if you go to these online marketplaces you get resumes and people bidding for your work you know so you may have a work spec and then you put your job out and then people bid on it. Now you got to review all the bids and resumes. Now you hire a few people. Now you've got to manage them. Yeah. And there's all oh, this pain. And so Media Piston was flipping that. It was like, what if there was a service where you could come with your credit card and your spec and we, Media Piston, would manage that for you? But the, of course, that sounds hard, right? The way we'll do it, though, is we implement a process quality control, a software-driven system that will handle all of the editorial review passes in an automated way and then have a marketplace of labor so that was the idea we were prototyping and got it working enough where it had revenue and customers and the quality was, was okay and that's that's what i decided to go and and pursue full-time but you're, right. you're essentially saving the time that it takes to find an actual freelancer and get your work done and manage them too because the problem too you'll get is you hire somebody and, and you look at the work that this is great. And then you realize they stole it, you know, plagiarized or whatever. So we built plagiarism detection automated. Mm -hmm. And this would be like, it got sophisticated to the point where if you were on the supply side of the marketplace as a writer, you know, you would be automatically welcomed and trained mm -hmm. and get your first assignments on a metered basis. So you couldn't cause too much damage if you were bad. Mm -hmm. If you were plagiarizing, you would get, um, what's the word? Um, you would get shadow banned, you know, uh, so that you wouldn't figure out you were banned until there was too much pain for you so that you would not just create another account and exploit us. There was all that sophistication was in there as well as the other side, which is if you were really good, then you would earn more money. You would get promotions, bonuses, and there was a whole speedy delivery concept. The client could pay more money, get faster mm -hmm. turnaround. And all we would do is just route those to the very best uh, writers in the system. And then we right be able to skip steps to get the work done quickly because those people were proven high quality trustworthy individuals this is still an unsolved problem right i mean we still have like up for work and other marketplaces where it's still a tedious job to you know find someone to do the work and manage yeah. it it's still a problem uh what, what happened to the company yeah i, I think you actually sold it right sold it to upwork they were called odesk at the time but right. and, and the pitch and the pitch was when I met them, I said, Hey, I, I was actually working on another startup idea. And for that startup idea, I needed content. And so I went to Upwork and Elance and I ran into all these problems and it was incredible. Like I had, I think $5,000 I wanted to spend on content for a project. And it was just incredible to me that like how difficult it was to spend $5,000. I mean, I know exactly what I want as a result work quality wise and i have five thousand dollars and and yet it's going to be potentially impossible to get my quality and not go crazy you know so that when i discovered that i was that's the startup if i can solve that and it just so happened that i thought with a process quality control system you know with automated scoring and so really focused on that one problem the general horizontal marketplaces don't have that focus they're focused on other friction but not the work itself yeah. So I thought if I focus on the work itself, I can build something valuable. When I got the company to around 60,000 a month in revenue, I went to them 
I went to the Bay Area and I met a bunch of people just to sort of get customers. I said, this is working now. And I went to them saying, I'd like this to be on your radar. I started this company because the horizontal marketplace didn't work for me. This is one of your categories. And I started it because it didn't work for me as a customer. And now I'm serving it as a, as a business. And here's my revenue. Here are some of my customers. Now I'm going to grow it. You know, but maybe we can partner. Maybe there's a way in the future where we can, you know, power a part of that vertical for you. It's a better customer experience, you know. Yeah. Um, and they and their competitor was uh, called, um, so there was Elance and Odesk. I met with both of them. And both of them, within the first two meetings, wanted to just buy the company. <laughs> they were... They were like, well, you've bootstrapped this. You have no investors. It's going well. Why don't we buy you? Like, it's win-win, you know? So I, I kind of had that choice of like, do I put a couple of years into this or do I sell it now? You know, it's a split the difference thing. Bird mm -hmm. in hand. Around the time, you know, the details there were like, I bootstrapped, so I put my own money in. And I was, you know, I think I'd, I was $200,000 of my own money in. I wanted to climb the mountain myself with no oxygen, you know, so completely bootstrap. Uh, but I, my one of my uh, mentors told me, you you have raised money. You raised money from your kid's college fund. <laughs> so, oh, when you put it like that, I guess you're right. You know, either way, it's the same. It's just money and risk and upside. Yeah. Uh, I think you wrote, in, you wrote somewhere it's like, you know, it was the wrong move, right? I was uh, while doing research for this conversation. I think somebody wrote that this might not have been the right move for you. Well, it's impossible. I mean, at the time, Google was making pretty aggressive moves with their algorithm to sort of punish SEO people and content farms. There were a couple of very big content farm businesses that were just publishers, you know, doing content farm stuff. And when they made those changes, those businesses got killed, you know. And so I was selling to smaller businesses that were using us for legitimate purposes, but ultimately SEO was a huge component of it. So I thought, you know, this could go sideways or I need to fundamentally pivot. This is not going to be an easy road necessarily if somebody wants to buy it right now. And then I get the bigger entity marketplace that I can plug into and grow. And I kind of upside through that as well. Maybe that's not a bad idea, you know? Um, so I ended up choosing to do that. It could have been, you know, if you grow something from 60,000 revenue to 600,000 a month revenue, and you look at the SaaS multiples on that, of course, that could have been amazing, life-changing, much better if I'd been patient. Mm -hmm. So then you, uh, exited that company. Did you, do you happen to work there for a while or like, what was the exit? Time? I did. It was the, the idea was to integrate it into the vertical and so forth um they had other ideas after the acquisition around their own core business slowing down mm -hmm. at the time so they 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 kind of had a this was not known to me but pretty much immediately after the acquisition at the board exec team level it was like it was like alarm you know we have all hands on deck fix our core growth problem that means no no new projects no distractions we need to fix the core and it was like this media piston thing we should not spend time on at all. So it kind of left us as like, Hey Joe, you can move to California and, you know, help us on that. Or you can keep running media piston, mm -hmm. but it'll be totally a separate entity. Um, and so I was like, for me to be part of that is not what I told the company for. I enjoy working on this. I'm not going to get to integrate it and see the upside of that, but I don't want to move to California and take, take a job. Um, so I hung out for a while running Media Piston as an independent, wholly owned entity. Um, it was and, silly. And then you moved to Madrona Venture Labs? Yeah, I started at Madrona as an EIR um, and and hanging out. Greg Gottesman had an idea, had the idea for Madrona Venture Labs. Um, I think growing out of his experience with Startup Weekend and Rover, where it's fun to start companies and maybe orchestrate the founding team and funding. And he's good at that and the people part of it and so forth. So he's like, why don't we kind of do the Rover thing, but it, as a thing, as an entity, you know, Madrona Venture Labs, Madrona will get some money in. Let's prove the concept out. 
It's been a couple of companies. And so by that time, I didn't have an idea for what my next company would be. Hmm. I was just an EIR, just sort of exploring things. I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting vehicle to to explore and build and do. Let's do it. So we got a little bit of money and grew a small team and spun some companies out. And then at what point did you decide to start Crowdcom? Well, I realized um, without going into like the business model, there's a hypothesis around any business and a, a, a venture incubator business, there's a hypothesis around we can create a company or we can justify our equity stake and we can you know, present a better opportunity cost for a founder that we're pulling out of a bigger company or whatever. And we get it. There's, there's a reason to believe that that model can be good for everyone mm-hmm. without going into that. That was part of the equation. Uh, but my main decision sort of for moving on was I, I learned that about myself is I'd rather be all in on something and incubating a company, working on it for the first three to six months and then handing it over to some other team to go run with and just being like an advisor or just, you know, helping from a distance is not ultimately where I can get satisfaction. Mm-hmm. I get satisfaction when it's like you fully are on the hook. And it, it's also like you're, I don't yeah. know how much, how the, like the compensation incentive structure works, but um, like, do you get incentivized if the company becomes big? As a person working in the labs? Yeah. Absolutely. And is that a significant one or compared yeah. to like being a co-founder? No, not not as much as being a co-founder, but it could be, let's say you over 10, pick two years, you spin out 10 companies. Mm-hmm. You have much smaller stake in each of those 10 companies. But rather than have all your eggs in one basket, you've got you also to have a portfolio of companies. Now. Yeah. And so that may be worth it, right? Yeah. Otherwise, as a founder, you go start something, you could easily sink years into it and come up with a zero. That's yeah. actually a common case, right? At every stage from idea to seed to, you know, A to B, at every stage, there's like, what, a 90% fail Elevation. rate? Yeah. So, and each time you double down, you're all or nothing style doubling, you know, down and, and putting more years in, a couple more years at each juncture. So as a founder, yeah, there's tremendous upside, but it's it's an all or nothing bet. You know, you got to have a lot of luck in there and um, along the way to make it economically work out. And I think I think the big problem with, with startups, at least until this downturn, which I'm so happy there's a downturn in a way, yeah. but- Prior to the downturn, you know, the FANG company industry salaries got to the point where in a risk adjusted way, you have to look at it like, I don't know, there may be better upside in that than starting a company. Uh, you know, I definitely looked at that. And that's one of the reasons I didn't do an MBA because the opportunity cost for me was too high uh, yeah. for doing an MBA. Like it was the opposite in your case. Uh, but yeah. for me, it was like, there's too much opportunity cost I'm losing yeah. on two years. What, if you could believe it, you know, person like me with, I mean, I had a technical background with, with success as a technology person, I would say, um, back to an MBA. Now I've got a dual combo, MBA plus tech. I'm coming back, you know, I, and I looked at some of the, the FANG types of companies of that era, job offers, if you could believe it or not right out of MIT Sloan, which is a top MBA, and have a good resume, tech and business together with Relevant, the job offers were less money than I was making before I went to the MBA. <laughs> so I don't think that's the case now, I hope. But but it was like, for me, it was like, of course I'm going to start a company. Like, I'll be able to get more funding for my idea and more upside in every sense of it more quickly than if I was working for one of these big companies. It's a no-brainer. And I don't think that's the case now, necessarily. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so how did you pick the idea yeah, of CrowdCow? And you know, why did you pick that specific idea? Yeah, a few reasons. Um, I wanted to have a co-founder again. I did, didn't have one for Media Piston. I definitely, it's worth having a good co-founder. Uh, my co-founder, Ethan, and I had been friends for years, and we worked at the startup that I mentioned way back, the mobile thing. Um, so we had a good rapport and friendship and trust. Um, and we had been talking, I had been talking about, I want to start something about my co-founder. He said, yes, I'm ready again too, because he had a company before. 
uh, Urban Spoon. Um, and we just went through and, and started going, we committed to do something together and let's explore what. So we had, you know, ideas that we were testing. We actually were prototyping and doing like, you know, um, painted door tests of ideas on the internet. Like, and we had a spreadsheet, you know, with your idea of a passion, you know, market size, whatever, ranking and discussing. We were doing this every other day and sort of iterating. CrowdCow came about completely independent of that process. We had a mutual friend that had worked for him and, and me separately uh, who had done this thing where you go to a uh, directly to a farm to buy a whole cow worth of meat. Mm -hmm. And he just had randomly told me, oh, I'm getting my cow on Friday. I was like, what? You're getting a cow on Friday? It's like, oh, we get the meat of a whole cow. What? Tell me more. And he was telling me about this farm on Woodby Island and how it's more about the, the, the grass and the farming than the raising the animal. Well, that's important too. If you treat each animal with care and no stress, the meat tastes better. It's healthier. It's better for the environment. I really enjoy supporting this family. Oh, by the way, where they live on the island was because they were their family three generations ago came over on the boat that settled the island. So they got the pick of the best farmland. And again, the quality of the grass is what you know makes the better meat. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This is incredible. Can I have some? And he's like, oh, sorry, it's I it's allocated because I have a couple of family friends and we split it. I was like, well, can you introduce the farmer to me? And he said, oh, they only slaughter once a year. You're too late. You know? And then I realized like, ah, oh, he's, I can't have that. I want that. So again, it was one of those things. I have money in my hand. I can't have it. The friction to get it. I got to go meet farmers, drive out there with a truck. I got to have a meat freezer. So this is insane to me. I'll just go to the grocery store where they can't tell you what country the meat came from. They don't tell you to cook it. They don't know anything about it. It's a commodity. It's ridiculous. In fact, when you walk through the grocery store past the beer aisle or chocolate and cheese and wine, you can realize if you're old enough that those used to be commodities too. But somehow, for some reason, they've transformed in our lifetime to offer choices, varieties, quality, taste, sustainability, and connection to the source which the meat world just does not have. So as we looked into that, we were talking about this. Um, Ethan had the stroke of brilliance to say, well, what if we created a website where you could meet the farmer virtually with like a video and we would sell a cow one at a time. And as we were riffing on it, we we're like, yeah, it could be like crowdfunding a cow. So what do you want? Take the friction out. Tap your phone, it shows up. Not a whole cow in a freezer, five pounds, five to 10 pounds of meat. So we were kind of listing these things and we came up with the idea of crowdfund a cow, 50 shares, and you rally your friends to each buy a share. When all the shares are sold, the cow tips and you become a stakeholder, which is cute. That makes you smile. And th there's an interesting thing about that, which is that it's clear to see that that is important. Like support a small farmer. No, it's healthier. It tastes better. But the fact that you're tipping a cow, becoming a cow owner, a stakeholder is cute. It makes you smile. And that's just sort of a, and it's, it's a magic alchemy that I think makes the idea very compelling. So we looked at it like, hey, let's validate this idea as a business. Uh, we literally, you know, marched down to a Starbucks, talked to strangers, said, hey, we are product designers. Um, we're working on a business concept. We'd like to get your feedback. You know, do you eat meat? Yes. Well, here's the idea. And many of those people actually said, like, what is the URL? I want to I want to check it out. So we thought that's a buying signal. And then we spent like a week or two kind of mocking up the website, making it look real so that actually you could take a credit card, but it wouldn't do anything. There was no back end. We had no idea how to ship a product or anything. But we thought, let's launch it with our friends and see if they'll not only tell us that it's a good idea, but they'll actually put their credit card in and prepay you know, essentially. And they did. It was, it was very, very quick. Actually, we had customers in the first 24 hours from that weren't part of that original 100 person email list. They were in, you know, other States. They weren't just in Seattle. We had people from Chicago, uh, New York, and Florida and that we didn't know they're strangers. We thought this is great. Total strangers putting their money in, you know, this is, let's do it. So we 
kind of took that as the initial spark of we have a good idea enough to like let's go do our real homework like how do you actually is there enough where do you get the supply how are we going to scale this uh how do we ship orders how does you know farmers produce animals not steaks how what is the supply chain going to look like and where does it evolve to and just started working on it and sometime while working on it in that first six months or so you know we did another cow and another cow and something happened where it was just such a fresh and cool like idea it attracted lots of attention there were lots of lot to, like lots of press articles and too much attention we couldn't keep up with demand so for the next you know year and a half or so it was just an all hands on deck keep up with demand block and tackle grow the business and learn more about how to how to scale it followed by followed by six or seven more years like that basically and so you mentioned you know walking around the grocery store and this is one of the frustrating parts you know about eating meat in america is how fucked up it is um can you talk a little bit more about why it is like that yeah i'll give you like an anecdotal thing i've i've talked to a number of people who are from like other countries and even like second and third world countries and they'll say something like the chicken in my home country just tastes way better and why and you have to ask why is that and it actually comes down to a very simple thing when a chicken is just allowed to wander around openly and freely and be healthy and eat you know healthy food and peck bugs and have fresh air and sunshine and a beautiful life that meat will taste better actually it'll taste a lot better and people don't get that connection but when the animal is treated well and lives a natural life, the meat will be will taste better and be healthier for you. So I think in the, the US chicken is optimized to go grow really fast within six weeks, ready to slaughter. Yeah. No, and it's think... sci scientists are doing breeding programs over many generations to optimize for the breast meat grows really fast. And so these chickens barely can walk because they've been selectively bred to a point where they're physically weird. And, and not only that, and then the food is similarly chemically uh, mass produced to maximize yield of meat. Again, you, they get paid because it's a commodity on like, the, they want the lower cost going in, that's the food, and they want the highest volume of weighty material protein coming out. That's value. Yeah, It's price per pound. They're not optimizing for health of the animal. They're not optimizing for flavor. They're not op optimizing for your nutrition. They're optimizing for all that other stuff I just mentioned because it's sold as a commodity. Mm -hmm. Now, if it wasn't sold as a commodity, if it was sold for flavor and origin, then you could start to create a capitalist feedback loop that would incentivize those other things. And ultimately, that would be better for, for many consumers, most consumers. Consumers who care about the environment, who care about animal welfare, who care about what they're putting in their bodies and their children's bodies, and who care about flavor will be delighted to know that a pasture raised chicken tastes better and it's, and you'll, you'll be spoiled. I, yeah. I, in my life cannot eat chicken ever at basically any restaurant. I feel like I'm throwing my money away and that chicken may cost half the amount of money of a crowd cow chicken. But what's the point when I'm throwing away my money? Like you, if you paid 10 bucks for something that's worthless, you've wasted $10. If you pay $20 for something that's supporting a farmer that's committed to the environment and the product tastes better and is healthy for you, that's $20 well spent. So how did you make sure that, because what, what the average customer thinks is he's going to Whole Foods or, you know, Kroger's and he's thinking that there are a bunch of these green labels, organic, and he's thinking that he's buying an actual, you know, good tasting, well-grown chicken. But in 99% cases, it's not right yeah. how, how did you like source you know this for crowd cow we sourced directly it was literally knocking on doors and then we asked the early on we asked our first you know um butcher or, uh, and slaughter guys who worked in pacific northwest locally for years they knew all the farmers they see carcasses every day they're cutting the meat they're tasting it they're doing all that we asked them hey tell us where the best ones are Who's raising them? Right? You know, and we learned very basic things like, well, you know, this farm grows so much grass that they actually sell it to the neighboring farms. They have a surplus of grass. And we heard things like, hey, this other farm has to buy grass. 
you know, and when they're kind of running low on money, they can't afford it. And so that means the cows are a little bit skinnier and a skinnier cow is stressed out and doesn't, and is not as fatty, doesn't taste as good. So the grocery store can only tell you it's grass fed. And even that label has no standardized meaning. So it could be grass pellets in an industrial feedlot, uh, which is the majority of it, or it could be grass fed, but also grain fed. Like it's not, and, it, and it'll have that picture on the label of a farmer that's just stock art or whatever photo shoot. <laughs> what we were selecting for was meeting the people, getting to know them, understanding their reputation. Then we do taste testing, et cetera, to, to buy us for the farms that were the ones that were growing a surplus of grass and selling it to the neighbor farms and were consistently producing meat quality that was amazing. We started like that and grew from there. Got it. Um, so you did that for almost seven, nine years. And now in your typical fashion, you're all in on AI. Uh, so let's talk about AI, right? Um, you know, what do you think is broadly happening? Because, you know, I've, I've done machine learning like five years back, right? There was no excitement about machine learning. Um, but now, you know, with chat GPT and the explosion of the tools around it, you know, the, the prod public APIs that are available, the number of companies that are being sprung up around the, you know, hype that sort of started by open AI. Um, how do you, broadly see what is happening right now in AI. Sure. So, you know, I, I've kept going to the UW PhD computer science symposiums and understanding where the research trends have gone. And, and so I was seeing around about 10 years ago, you know, all the PhDs were sprinkling machine learning into every domain, whether it was databases or, you know, user experience design. AI was a research thing. And then you saw the benchmarks being hit and exceeded in the sort of standardized benchmark categories around whether it's computer vision or natural language processing, et cetera. They were just up and to the right. You could just see that. And so you kind of knew as an like a computer scientist, entrepreneur, but not a researcher, you could see that like, oh, there's something happening here. And for me, it was when Google entered the academic contest and blew away everybody with the win. And it was like a massive jump. And you started to, if you talk to researchers, they were like, yeah, there's this new approach. And it sort of invalidates 10 years of research. And it's really simple. That's where you had Google Translate saying we released, you know, we we replaced like millions of lines of code with like, I think it was 50,000 lines of code. So it's like a simple model, a very powerful approach, and it just performs better. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, you, you see that as an entrepreneur or computer scientist, and you you have to pay attention. Okay, what is happening, fast forward now, four or five years, is the large language models and generative have clearly proven through their emergent abilities that we've crossed a threshold. Like no, no longer are these things just interesting or simpler replacements for standard tasks like categorization or, you know, um, that these things are actually performing human level reasoning at a human level. It brings me back to my, I was creating a marketplace with software plus humans. The humans were providing reasoning and judgment. And now all that's coming again with AI. So it's like fundamentally, it's a new, a fundamental new tool has been added to the toolbox. Like, like we added databases or we added networks, right? Or we added the mobile platform. We've just added human reasoning as a programmable element that's pretty profound and that's why i'm excited about it <laughs> I, you, what it means is all of the things that you would ever in the last 20 years thought of as approaches to solve a particular problem can now be rethought and maybe you could solve problems that couldn't have been solved before or you could solve existing problems in in a way that's transformatively better it's a new tool and it's super early. So for me, it's it's the most compelling technology thing that's happened in my lifetime, even more than the internet, because you can use this to create things more directly than, than any other transformative shift. You're almost adding foundational intelligence layer. Uh, so that gives us an opportunity to enhance existing products and also like, reading some of the new products, right? Yeah. Um, and people and go, people, the two criticisms people have are, well, Joe, but they're not that good or they're biased or they make mistakes. So do humans, yeah. you know, or uh, 
or they say that's oh, going to replace people's jobs. I don't buy that at all. Every time that you know you've created a technology that's useful, it'll find its way into more applications. You know, I think that AI may <laughs> maybe it'll mean that the 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 DMV software will be better. You know, because you know what I'm saying is like if it didn't make sense, digital transformation efforts. That word, a digital transformation effort, created so much bad software and so much more software because it just brought the cost down and open source brings the cost down. So, so software ends up in more places. There are many more programming jobs than there were. At the, when I started my career, you had to be designing software for a business person in an office environment on a Windows machine. And the internet was barely a thing. Um, now software is in everybody's pockets everywhere all the time. AI just makes it even 10 times more applicable to different scenarios. And it will just increase the demand for people who are creating software. I think we, we are sort of creating abundance in a lot of ways, right? Every time there's a there's been a technology shift, we've created a world of abundance. Like, you know, when AWS was not there, racking up servers was hard and it's only specific people with specific skills that could do it. Now everyone can do it with a click, right? It sort of created a new abundance. Um, and I think, yeah, to your point, uh, about employment, I think people will work at a different abstraction level. Like, like we sort of have now jobs that are not imagined like 15 years back. We didn't have social media manager, right? Uh, we didn't have like a YouTube thumbnail creator. Like that's a thing now. Um, so I think we'll see new jobs uh, for sure. Um, have you thought about who's capturing, you know, all this value um, and what type of you know, value it looks like. Uh, have you thought about that? I mean, a little bit. It's it's always going to surprise you, I think, in the end. You know, I think if you were in the first 10 years of the internet and you thought about e-commerce ideas, the kinds of ideas that were needed then are not the kinds of opportunities that we see now. And it doesn't mm -hmm. mean the game's over or you were too late. So, you know, I can remember talking about like, well, maybe there's going to be a opportunity for a business to create like a widget that allows you to sign. Cause you know, before e-commerce, you always sign. Yeah. So how are we going to do that online? You need a widget, you know? And of course that's a bad idea. I didn't need it, but like, but like the idea of like, you could create a drop ship company on TikTok. like try explaining that e-commerce genre to yeah. someone in 1998. You didn't have social wasn't even a thing. Mobile wasn't a thing. Drop ship wasn't, a thing yeah there was there wouldn't have been a way to go online and find factories in china in 1998 you know i mean how do you even so the idea of like yeah there's going to be this massive wave of companies that are drop ship on tiktok single brand single product multi-million dollar entities and you know a, a 17 year old kid can create from his bedroom pitch that idea in 1998 insane right but that's that's one of hundreds of new opportunities and I think AI is going to create like that. So I think the capture will be, you know, for platforms that enable that kinds of thing will be enormous. And for each of those businesses will be enormous. I'm kind of interested in those types of ideas, obviously. Um, well, the, one of the things that's also happening is like, you know, large companies acquiring the ML and AI startups like Mosaic ML was acquired by Databricks, Snowflake acquired Miwa. Like, what do you see why they're doing that? Well, I think there's a generational opportunity to, there are perceived generational opportunity to create like a foundational intelligence layer, the model layers first, and then infrastructure and then apps, right? And so the focus has been down here and then infrastructure in terms of the investment community and opportunities, because if you can lay the foundation that all these other things are built on top of, that's really valuable. So it feels like a moment, like the first time ever that many people are, thinking, geez, is Google disruptable? You yeah. know, the best, the most profitable business ever created that's impossible to compete against. Oh, actually, maybe it can be disruptive, uh, you know? And so if if building a foundational model in a certain way is an element of that disruption, then owning that's pretty valuable and let's go, you know? And I think that's why you see these massive, massive in, in deals, you know, investment deals in, in different foundational things happening right now. And it's partly, I guess, you know, create the best talent, like acquire the best talent as quickly as you can. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whatever the cost is. Yeah. Um, but uh, you, you started AI Tinkerers Group, right? And it's, I think, blowing up in every major city. Let, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. 
So the idea back in last year on September, October, I, you know, was, I knew that I was transitioning CrowdCow and finished the transition, which took a couple of years. Um, and then I had started to get my founding team for Blueprint together and we were going to incorporate. Um, by that time, I'd started to like, okay, I'm going to put myself out there a little more. I've been tinkering with AI for a long time. Now I'm going to be more public about it. And I want to try to meet other people who are tinkering because I'm going to need to recruit people eventually. And I want to learn. So let's do a meetup. And so I started doing the meetups. At that time, I met this guy, Alex Gravely, who's co-pilot dev. And we were chatting on Discord a lot. And so he started doing meetups in Austin. He came up with a name, AI Tinkerers, which is a better name than I had for my meetups. And we created a Discord together with the cities, just hoping maybe someone else will replicate this in other cities. Eventually, you know, the website, eventually a CRM and registration system and emails and this whole infrastructure out of our own need. The reason I did it again was to meet people to learn and for future recruiting value. Um, given how AI has been so hot and given this a new tool, there's a lot of people tinkering. And given that we, AI tinkerers is for builders, for active builders. So we are very deliberate about screening. You sign up, you have to provide your GitHub or LinkedIn. We scrape that, we look at it. You do not get into the meetup unless you are actively tinkering and, and can show that. If your day job is uh, as a VC or enterprise sales or a recruiter, you are not getting in. So anyhow, the idea behind tinkerers is creating a quality a level that is all tinkerers, not AI enthusiasts, it's AI tinkerers. And so that's been the model from the beginning. And that's what's created this sort of like high quality of attendee. And people go and say, this is wonderful. Everybody's building something. And people can be very vulnerable. People can find collaborators. People can, you know, share early access codes to things. And so it's it's just taken off based on that quality, I think. And so now, yeah, we have AI Tinkers has launched in London or it's launching in LA. It'll launch in New York City in, in two weeks. Um, it's launching in uh, places in Canada uh, and in Europe soon. We've got two different groups I'm speaking to around launching it in Europe. So it's a very, that's very, it's definitely um, had more of a success than I, than I kind of aimed for, but certainly uh, happy to support it. Uh, well, we're almost at the end of the conversation. So I want to quickly ask um, some questions that I ask every guest at the end of the show. Um, first one, uh, who are the mentors who shaped your career? Mentors that shaped my career? Yeah. They've, they've changed over time. Um, but I would say early on, it was those those people at, at um, Starwave and those colleagues, um, including, you know, people I worked with very closely, like Daryl Cavins and Patrick O'Donnell, who was... Um, and, you know, Adam, who's my co-founder, uh, and Nathan, I consider mentors. We help each other in different ways. Um, people from the venture community, Greg Gottesman was certainly very, very kind and helped me when I was early on in, in my career, but also to get into Madrona and inside that world a little bit to get an exposure for the other side of the table and with Venture Labs. Um, um, so, you know, it's been just people who've been just very giving with their time and, and open to collaborate. What do you wish you knew when you're starting out your first company that you're not now? I wish I knew when I started my first company. Um, I think that just knowing that, uh, what's that? That there is no, there is no manual. You're never, there, there's no like prerequisite or course or that you just have to jump in and do it. I think, um, uh, I, th I think that's it. It's, I, I guess that it's more about, it's not about the, um, define the goal, work backwards to a perfect plan, or what's the preparation I need to take the first step, that it's more about in the moment, athleticism during and in the obstacle course. That and just to persevere, to be patient and persevere. Um, Got it. Those two things together, actually, a third principle would be don't roll boulders up the hill. You know, It should be about discovering the alchemy. The thing. When it works, it works, and it feels very natural. Now, the advice is always work work doubly hard, pull an all-nighter, run through walls. And that is definitely an element. But when it really is going to be successful, it does feel natural. And it feels like it's you've just created the thing that is working on its own very naturally. And it feels effortless. 
I wish I wish someone had sort of mentored me on that earlier. Um, any books that are your favorites or anything interesting that you're reading right now? Um, I'm reading a Werner Herzog uh, book about his time filming the movie um, Fitzcarraldo. I do not recommend that. It has nothing to do with entrepreneurship, but it's a great read. Um, I, I like to pour your heart into it from Howard Schultz, just facing rejection over and over and over again and not giving up. You only need one person to say yes, you know, the founder of Starbucks. That's a great book, a very principled person. Um, I think that's an inspiring read. Um, the, uh, the book by Ray Dalio called Principles is excellent. I, I wish I'd read that book when I was in my 20s. It didn't exist, but it's, it's an incredible culmination of a very smart person's experimentally testing ideas to result in principles that can be then applied going forward and it's like an encyclopedic like reference on that it's just absolutely incredible I, would, I, would I, I tried reading that book and it's a very thick book by the way and one of the things i felt was like ray dalio is operating at a such a different level like is it going to make sense to a lot of people who read this that that, that was my takeaway from it uh i don't know what you think about it but uh, yeah i mean for me it balances that i'm very good in the tactical like give me you know 15 minutes to create the new feature and prop it live on the website or debug something splunking into seven systems whatever i'm great at that and i'm great at creatively the creative ideas that connect the dots so the principled thing around structured ways of thinking for me is really valuable in a complementary way. And finally, any advice to recent college grads who are interested in you know starting their own company? No, I love that. I absolutely love it. Um, I always have gone back to recent college grads and I did it for Media Piston. I'm doing it again now. I think it takes a very special type of person. I always look for you know, significant things that are not on the resume. You know, I want self-driven, like I was, oh, I built this whole thing on my spare time. Look at it. It's pretty complicated. I just figured it out. No one, it didn't come from a class or a job. And it was through enormous sheer force of will that they figured out on their own, like that kind of tenacity and creativity and drive in a technical domain that, that shows the skills to sort of navigate the obstacle course of entrepreneurship. You know, um, th that's kind of what it takes, the raw talent. And so I love working with people like that, even young in their early in their career. Just to push a little bit on that, like, did you find more ways to identify raw talent? Because, I mean, you've done three, four companies. Now you're building another company. Like, have you found any specific techniques to hire good talent? Specific techniques? Yeah. I think relationships is the key. It takes more work, but that's the way to do it. I, I, that's why, you know, I'm doing the meetup group and I have coffee with people. Um, I'm not hiring right now in a big way at all, but when I am ready to hire, I know it will be much easier for, for me having this network of people that I know personally and trust. And we've had a, and we've helped each other in a non-business context, just as people, when I need to go back to them and say, Hey, do you know anybody? Are you interested? It'll be much better and, and, a, and more likely a good fit. Than, than if I was just working through a recruiter or posting online, you know, that, that requires a lot more rigor on the other side of it in terms of screening and interview process. And I just think ultimately a lot more risk in the hire. Um, thanks, Joe. That was a great answer. And I think a good ending to the conversation as well. Uh, thanks for coming out of the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me.